Indian Board for Women's World Banking, a leading global livelihood promoting institution and continues to be an advisor to SEWA. She has previously served on several public boards and is a charter member of TAI, has served in the committee of the Indian Venture Capital Association, Bombay Chambers of Commerce and Industry, and been a mentor to Facebook She Leads Tech, an active contributor to the dialogue on corporate governance and diversity Anjali co-founded and chaired the FIKI Center for Corporate Governance Program for Women on Corporate Boards. She has been listed as one of the most powerful women in Indian business by India's leading publication, Business Today, and by Fortune India. She's a frequent speaker at multiple international forums and a jury member for awards, including ET40, Under 40, Women Ahead, CEO Awards, and others. Welcome, Anjali. And I now request Shunali to take over for today's conversation. Thank you for the exceedingly kind introduction. I did not quite expect that, but thank you. So Rangapriya was out of breath, I noticed. Yes. <laughs> because I have read books that are shorter than this introduction. <laughs> and my first question to you is that uh, growing up, did you anticipate that you will have an endless list of achievements by this time in your life? Wow, uh, okay, that's an interesting question. I I think growing up, uh, it was, I did not know what I would do, but I knew I would do something. And it was not an option. And I was sharing this with a few other friends earlier that in growing up in my home, was, it was not an option to actually not plan to do something in life. What one would do, it was not clear. Um, but there was always an interest in of development and serving the country to some extent. I come from a family that has a lot of history of serving the country. Um, and as it turns out in India, if you're half decent at math and science, you end up doing engineering or medicine, so I did engineering. But I always had an interest in whether it is policy or, but technology has been a fascination forever. So no, Shunali, I did not know what I would be doing. <laughs> but I'm an overachiever at school as well, huh? I don't know about that. I'll have to go back and check with my school cal pal. <laughs> but so I want to uh, probe this further. Engineering was not a natural choice of passion for you, but you did it because most of us at that time were choosing to be doctors or engineers. Is that right? And I, how yes. has it been to you in your life, your engineering degree? It's actually been more helpful and useful than one would have thought. I so I worked, uh, my first sort of professional role really was in a lab at ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. That's right. And it was absolutely fascinating. Now, looking back, I can, it, it feels to me like, how cool was that, right? Because this was where we did satellite payload design and you get to be this young little engineer who's tinkering away. But it, is, it was not very exciting in the moment. And that was the awakening that while I, I, I'm fascinated endlessly by space and technology and I grew up, I'm, you know, we are the generation that grew up on Star Trek and Star Wars and, and Carl Sagan and Cosmos. Right. So while there can be endless fascination with space and the frontiers of science in that sense, but I could not do that day in, day out um, as a profession. So very quickly moved out of engineering. But I think the, the training that, that gives you the comfort with uh, sort of numbers and analytics, it stands you in good stead. I think it's a great set of tools to have in your life toolkit, so to speak. Right. So, uh, you know, when you started your corporate innings post ISRO, you got a degree in finance after that or around the time. Right. Didn't you? That's right. After so that. When you started your corporate innings at that time. Uh, how receptive was the environment to the mentoring of a woman or, or, or women of your caliber to help them to really achieve the highest potential professionally? So I was extremely fortunate. My first of role uh, in quasi-business was at Women's World Banking in New York. And that's before I actually got my full graduate degree in finance. And the Women's World Banking obviously was one of the big networks in microfinance at that time. You know, 30 years ago, microfinance was not mainstream. Most people did not know what it meant. So the whole notion of how you can financially empower poor women at the bottom of the pyramid and consequently provide social and economic and political empowerment was very fascinating. My first real job was actually at McKinsey in New York. So postgraduate school and much like I think we, we are so much a product and I'm eternally grateful to my parents and my family for 
the in some ways the nurturing and the uh, inspiration they gave me i am eternally grateful to mckinsey a lot of who i am as a professional today has been shaped by the firm mm. and uh, shanali gender was not even a thing it was not even on the table in new york uh, or in india as well in new york in new york so i joined mckinsey in new york i worked there for a few years doing mostly strategy consulting for what was fig financial institutions group Right. so with investment banks and asset management companies and insurance companies and more often than not one was the only woman in the room both in on the the mckinsey team as well as the client team and now i'm totally dating myself and i say this was way back in the mid 90s right so very few women anywhere and uh, it was just phenomenal you didn't feel that um, there was a of course you know but didn't go out drinking at night quite as often with the boys and so on but that was okay and i had terrific mentors who took a great interest in uh, partly it is the firm culture the firm culture is one around apprenticing and uh, nurturing and coaching and developing the younger folks mm -hmm. and uh, so i think it's a i owe a lot to the firm and for not having felt discriminated against so i think i stood out more for the funny accent and for yeah. being this sort of weird sort of woman from yeah. india versus being a woman putra pali from the big bang theory basically totally totally putra <laughs> pali so you know the thing is that possibly you were fortunate because some of the other women i have met who you know sort of uh, claim their own place under this sun in the corporate and world of finance uh, feel that there really was and continues to exist some sort of a glass ceiling if it escapes you then a lot of it has to do with uh, good fortune because there is a boys club that exists now whether they go out drinking or they play golf but there is such a thing as a boys club uh, it may be more subtle now right but uh, i was mentioning that book to you the other day it's full of stories by women at the right. top who experienced it at some stage of the life or another uh, so i guess now there's got to be a reason to why so many women in india even though we are educating our women more today the girl child from the, the the least privileged families to the most privileged families are all it's become part of the cause to women for women to get qualifications across the board to a large extent compared to two decades ago and even then between 2004 and 2012 25 million actively working women dropped out of the workforce this has been unprecedented to say a decade before that we don't have more data but it is unlikely that the statistics have improved in favor of working women so why do you think this has happened because it happened starting at the lowest and all the way to the top according to uh, to research and data so so two points you raised shanali one is is this normal and was it different in india for that matter so i moved to india in 2000 and i think attitudinally at some some level the attitudes are different i mean there was a whole bunch of tremendous role models for me at mckinsey new york for example senior partners who had three kids and would manage to build successful careers and were extremely well regarded so no one sort of talked about oh but she leaves at 7 pm because not just she but a lot of our senior men partners also left because they wanted to see the kids right um i think there is a cultural element and there is a role modeling element um we've not really had a for at least women of our generation a significant cohort above us mm. who we could look at and say okay you know there is a model that you can actually replicate so there's not that much two there are uh, societal attitudes that are very deep seated mm. so there's so much research that's been done on what's the leaky pipeline but the issue really is uh to a large extent we've actually fixed the i'm not saying we have fully fixed but we have started addressing mm. as a country and as a society the issue of women getting higher education so uh, presence of more girls and women in higher education is getting sorted so they do enter the workforce why they drop out is actually something that we need to address so there is a leaky pipeline phenomenon so you have more women entering the workforce i'll give, I'll give you an example right my a uh, freshman class we were 15 women in a class of 350 right so you do the math it's kind of about 5% right less than 5% today yeah yeah uh no engineering engineering okay. freshman right. columbia was grad grad school was That's very right. bad right. yeah yeah so engineering school uh, less than 5% today what i hear is it's closer to 30 35% so when you are entering classes have a much higher participation of women 
then they come out most of them sort of will go and take up jobs and enter the professional workforce what happens in between the ages of sort of 28 and 38 is where a lot of dropout occurs that's right and there i think if you think about sort of you know the four big actors in this there is the state so the country the law or the regulation yeah, the policy the regime yeah. and the yeah. state the policy regime yeah. uh you have organizations and companies and other organizations so institutions and so on you have families and society Right. and then you have the choice so i think for the most part not just india but a lot of countries around the world have actually addressed the larger issue around state support so we have laws that support wage parity participation of women in the workforce the maternity act and so on so i don't think we can expect more from the state per se right uh, good organizations progressive organizations are some slower some faster but they are making continuous consistent progress towards more um and i don't i don't particularly care about equality i think just more equitability and a more level playing field and more inclusion so most good organizations are thinking about inclusion and taking steps for that hmm. the issue is how do we solve for our deep seated societal attitudes then fundamentally ultimately it comes to her the woman hmm. the individual she has to it's not easy none of these are easy things in a societal environment with a lot of friction in your family with your spouse in your society you know with your children's classmates and their families she has to want it badly enough mm-hmm. to make it work right yeah it can't be easy juggling all of it uh, cannot be easy and and if you want you know there are women who say i don't want to have children i don't want to get married i guess for them the the choice is right. Right. very easier right? it's just a linear uh, path forward mm-hmm. uh, but for women who sort of want more than just that and i'll come to that right. in a bit but uh, it's been noted it's been observed that by the time women reach mid mid management level which is also mm-hmm. called the frozen middle apparently uh, 48% of them drop out because i think they believe that this is the best that they can really achieve and really can't get past that so uh how difficult was it say in your particular case by the time you reached mid management level because by that time you were also a mother and presuming and you also mm-hmm. you know uh, you had a life that extended outside of the workplace uh so how difficult and challenging was it at a personal level to juggle this uh and were you ever on the brink of uh questioning your decision and thinking and maybe i should take a break and quit briefly or something like that So, so you ask very compound questions. So I'm going to break that down. I'll try. No, that. because I only twenty five minutes. I do not. You are not asking everything. <laughs> okay. So let's Super. break it down. First, so is let's break it down. Mid management level. Why did they drop out at that time? So mid management level. I think the 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 fundamental issue is that the years of their life, where where young women are building their families, and having children, getting married, having children, etc., are also the years where they're building their career. Right. so there is such an immediate overlap and there i think the so, so, sort of society and families play a role where women get married and they expect to have children very quickly so they are very much in the build phase of their career so they aren't even at a point where they can cruise control right. they still have to strive they still have to be climbing steps right. and then suddenly they say oh, you know i need a landing i cannot climb steps anymore so they get stuck at the landing and meanwhile everyone moves forward and then that gap sort of just keeps growing wider so that's one issue uh but that's still sort of corporate mid management i do think that there are very deep seated attitudes and safety in the workplace which has to get instituted for uh sort of women on shop floor etc et but coming back to mid level so that's where a lot of drop out happens even the best organizations in their uh, with the best of intentions they tend to play a somewhat sort of patriarchal role sometimes towards women and say you know she is poor thing she has young children let's yeah. not give her the stretch role okay. now if she is not even offered the stretch role she cannot take the stretch role and grow so if she is not growing obviously relatively she is getting left behind uh wage disparity starts to occur families start making choices around what's the best thing to do for the family sort of you know the pooled family income and that whoever is earning more tends to get primacy so i think some of those factors come into play but coming back uh, patriarchy it is subtle patriarchy even yeah. under the best of circumstances at play it is very well meaning it is very well intentioned it is caring yeah. but yeah. it is what it is it is still making decisions for her versus giving her five opportunities and saying okay pick one yeah. 
But then if you pick one, you must deliver. So that's my second point where regardless of what it is, see, no, you can't have it all. There is this whole notion of can you have it all? No, nobody can have it all. I know plenty of men and I have lots of men friends and colleagues who would love to spend more time with their children and with their family. So it's, it's always a trade-off. It's always a choice. And it's a constrained optimization sort of game, right? So you've got right. to give a little on many different fronts. Sometimes you give a little on work. Sometimes it, you give a little on personal time. Um, so yeah, so that's how it is. Uh, Mid-level, I think difficult choices to be made are when children happen. Right. Um, I and think uh, famous maternal guilt then, because yeah. I think, you know, Simone de Beauvoir, the famous uh, French feminist, wrote a book called The Second Sex and you know I mean even if you call me to discuss world economics which you will never if you have any sense because I know nothing of it I somehow bring that up because I want every woman every living woman to read that book okay right mm -hmm. and so according to that she says that you're not you're not born a woman you become one what that means mm -hmm. is that there's such a strong overlay of what is expected of a woman that you're born as an equal but you're constantly told what is expected of you. So there's an overlay of morality and societal expectations on a woman. So, you know, we are struggling to be homemakers, to, you know, to, to hire staff, to train them, to go to work, right. earn money, to turn out good students, or good, good, raise, raise good kids, mm -hmm. uh, be there for parent-teacher meetings. And basically we are, and also then be these delightful wives who are always, you know, exciting to their husbands and in good shape. So the problem is then, that there is far more pressure that lies on a woman's uh, shoulders than, than on a man. So even though neither gender can have it all, for us, it's not even something we can dream of, okay? A man can mm -hmm. easily say that you take care of my parents. You're talking mm -hmm. to mom, why do I need to talk to her? So the problem right. here though, is that even right now during the lockdown, during this pandemic, uh, women are working from home, the women that I know are mm -hmm. saying they can't wait for their offices to open because now they are managing far more than their husbands even at home. So the husbands are pitching with a little bit of work, but see, when a woman works and takes care of her children, she's being a mother, a nurturer. When a man takes care of his children, he says, I'm babysitting today. But it's your baby. What do you mean you're babysitting, right? So I think somewhere there is a very complex issue that all women need to address at a personal level during conversations gently with the men and the women in their homes. Don't you agree? I absolutely agree. I think there is a dialogue that needs to be had, which is why ultimately it does come to the individual and unfortunately places even greater burden on the woman to have some of these difficult conversations. But change has to start from within. And when it comes to sort of educated um, women who are more or less starting at a common level playing field, then there is a little bit more expectation to do more and kind of role model for your children, both boy and girl children as to what it means um sometimes it feels to me that our women are actually our girls our young women are a generation ahead of our young men and i have two boys for example and i keep we keep having some very fun conversations as you can imagine on uh, uh dinner table lunch table whatever it is on why is this notion of equality important because growing up in a home like ours for them it's a given they don't understand what, what's the big deal. I mean, I've actually had one of them say, what's the big deal? I said, it is a big deal. And then we read some statistics together. I had sent them some articles to read, some of the stuff Shinali you've described. It. it is a big deal. And so we do need people like you and your generation to be mindful of this. Yeah. So, also, you know, like people say that, you know, why is casteism such a big deal? I've never faced it or I've never mm -hmm. faced gender bias. Mm -hmm. I think all of us need to understand that those of us who haven't faced it is a bit privileged. Yeah. Right? It, 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 we haven't faced it because we are fortunate we are born mm -hmm. into those kind of families but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist and that doesn't mean that we don't start doing something about it speaking of which a very important question is that uh, you know over the years women who have had to break the glass ceiling and mm -hmm. rise to the top uh, and putting so much at stake because of that during their journey have internalized the power dichotomies that they themselves had to struggle against. And instead of laying a smoother path for women to rise, uh, you know, they have uh, sort of, you know, they have traded that for just keeping that same narrative of 
you know i i mm. made it my, despite my challenges she can find for herself it's that sarvi mm. kabhi bahuti syndrome so do you agree it's true and if it's true how can we sensitize women to this right. we can't place all the blame right. on the door of men i again completely agree i think it's so much a kyunki saas bhi kabhi bahuti syndrome that you know i had to really rough it out so why should anybody else have an easier path uh, i think that is where one does think that you you are almost you know there's a noblesse oblige around it if you are fortunate enough and and destiny has been kind to you and of course you have worked very very hard there is there is uh, we did not talk about that it just doesn't happen right you yeah. do have to work very hard you have to stay extremely committed you have to make tremendous sacrifices but if you've done all of that and you are in a position to make some change happen then why not do so why not be the voice i remember talking to cynthia caro cynthia was the first female ceo of any major global mining company so she was the ceo of anglo american cynthia if i don't uh, if i remember correctly i actually had four children and she used to travel the world and obviously as you can imagine right american running uh, english company headquartered in london and with operations all over the world you know my name she actually set a goal saying it is not enough to say we have increased the percentage of women in the workforce because they will keep adding women to staff mm. so they call it above ground and below ground mm. she says we need to bring more women below ground so of course there were all sorts of objections but how do you do it it is not safe and then there are no toilets she said then by all means build toilets mm. so until you get women below ground until you get women in line operation how will you make the change happen so similarly all of us who are fortunate and privileged enough to have a voice and a voice that matters mm-hmm. um i think we are obligated to use that voice for good and it could be it need not be gender it could be overall diversity and inclusion it could be fairness it could be esg but by all means let's use our voices um so when you were working at spencer stewart right you were now dealing with really really senior management levels and hiring for that was there ever a preference indicated by your client to uh, look out only for or uh, you know a gender a gender bias that did you notice that ever that you know we prefer a so, guy for this yeah. so i saw more at least at the kind of work i did i saw i saw more positive gender bias towards having we need to get more women so you know if you're looking for a board member let's get a if we can let's find a woman um see this whole thing about let's get a nobody really says anymore let's get a man it's about you know who will be more comfortable can they rough it out who do you have better chemistry with so those sorts of things are there and you do need to engage your clients in good conversation and say but why do you think so yeah. have you met so and so Right. Now I won't take names, but you know, for example, we put a very senior Indian woman on the board of a global tobacco company, and they could not have imagined an Indian woman who would get on the board of a global tobacco company. Wow! So if we are willing to be somewhat sort of gender agnostic and leave, check the gender in at the door. Yeah. Being a board member is all about being a board member. Your liabilities are no more or less if you are a woman or a man. So then you just have to check it in at the door, and. sometimes have very interesting and sometimes a little brave conversation with you know, the if you watch mad men i know we've come a long way from the days of mad men but i'm saying it was so normalized that it will take forever to really be completely right. removed from the dna right and that was so much the norm and kind of you think about uh, look at all our wonderful men right our and we've all had amazing men in our lives i mean i like i said for our cohort most of our champions sponsors mentors bosses were men and they supported right so they were t- uh, terrific wonderful men they came from that generation or immediately after that generation mm-hmm. so for them to see the norm change so much i give them a lot of credit for being supporters and champions right yeah kinali you asked about the guilt the motherhood guilt yeah, it was, was a very interesting that, yeah. one yes. so i have a story to share on that So of course, you know, once one had children, and you went, you go through the pangs of guilt, and you go to school, and all the other mothers are like there all the time, and you are not, and you're not baking anything, and you're not there for the class trips. Yeah. So you do tend tend to wonder, am I a good mother or not? So I did like condescending mothers, other condescending mothers. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, I have learned now to be incredibly grateful to all the women who do service in class, because they do look after the field trips and the class events. <laughs> So you must be very grateful to them. 
um so then yeah and celebrate them also so i actually did like a good little like the consultant did some expert interviews spoke to 15 women uh, of three segments those that had stayed on full throttle those that had stepped off completely and those in the in between who kind of sped up and slowed down at different points in the career and the only common thread i found is that the, the least satisfied least content women were those who felt who didn't make an active choice can you share so a bit more so and again I, i won't name names but you know i had a couple of friends who felt that because of family circumstances i couldn't work and so you know then there is the sense of i have not achieved full potential and not fulfilled hmm. on the other hand i also had friends who had very consciously actively chosen to not work full time outside the home professionally and to be a lot more involved in raising their children they were perfectly happy and similarly those that obviously stayed on full throttle had very few regrets the key thing here is don't have regrets make active thoughtful choices own the choice yeah and make the choice for yourself not because somebody else expects you to do something you know i was asked to once write a piece about this uh, for some but magazine i forget which and you know sometimes when you're writing you have a an epiphany you understand yourself better when you write some self discovery and i realized that i belong to the category of women and i'm sure there are many women in attendance today who deliberately gave up their active careers because they wanted to devote themselves to motherhood and do i have ever have a regret that i didn't work actively for all those years indeed i do uh but at the end you need to choose the regrets you can live with hmm. and you know i chose that i can live with that regret versus this regret so you'll never really have it all and i rarely doubt that anybody they were at a point in their life where they say i made this choice and i'm 100% convinced it was the right choice so you have to just see which regret you can cope with mm. and also look at then the environment at home which is the next question that uh, you were mentioning to me the last time we chatted that uh, the environment in your house and therefore the the family environment for women entrepreneurs and women in professions like you i mean uh, in in jobs outside uh, is what will for actually decide what way that career that woman's career and whether her potential is really achieved or not can we discuss that a little more so that we know what to ask our husbands for <laughs> i think first we have to uh, well this is in public forum but i will say it i think we are incredibly lucky to have the spouses we do and they say behind every successful man is a woman i think the opposite is even more true in our context in our, again in our social context uh, having a supportive enabling spouse is is a non trivial contributor to whatever success you have um uh, building that partnership at home and you know this this notion of joint parenting a partnership is about partnership in everything so it's joint parenting as well and it's not that only she has to go to the pta you know my husband was many times the only guy at the pta <laughs> Right. <laughs> and that's okay and by the way i have seen this change over the years i've seen so many more men get involved in school and that's terrific um so that is starting to shift the other piece around and i say this to young women very very often is build your domestic infrastructure just like you have a work team build your team at home over invest and in we are again you know in living in india we are fortunate we have helpers and again there are wonderful women who enable our success outside the home right so build that work just as you invest in your work team invest in your home team mm. and and then don't kind of stress too much about is every corner dusted and is every place setting perfect it's okay if it's not right so then the next question is voice yeah to be able to express yourself and to respect your desires and present it whether it's to your in-laws or to your children or to your husband one needs a voice and then one needs the same voice in the boardroom right well even if it's a family run boardroom how do not every woman is outspoken right what do you do to be able to have that courage of conviction to speak up and to be heard both ways hmm. so on a lighter note i think when your family realizes that it is better for everybody if you are at work because if you are at home you'll be very very cranky <laughs> there is so actually a very good threat to you that if 
you are not good to me you know what i think i need some time off and then they get very 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 alarmed and they say no please don't take time off <laughs> <laughs> ஒரு <laughs> 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 Mm. uh there are no winners and losers at home right you all need to be a winner at the end of it so there, there never should be a lose outcome so the the same skills that we think about like i said work team and home team you must think about what are win win outcomes for everybody and and there is a give and take and there is a um i call it a soft negotiation influencing give and take but you know that ambition in a woman even today is a pejorative word an ambitious man is a man who can look forward to a great future but whether you're in a boardroom again yeah. uh, or in a job at a lower level in an organization or in your own bedroom uh, an ambitious woman who chooses to you know go that extra hour at work rather than come home and be with the husband in laws or children is still looked at as somebody who is too selfish to be really valued as a woman how do women get over this complex and go out there and ask for what they want because there's even with that we are made to feel guilty i mean you and i are not we are fortunate but most of us most of women are i speak on behalf of all women in fact so 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 i kind of spend some time a lot of time actually with women who are coming through the mid level and that's where this problem is particularly acute the facilitation and i'll i'll share a couple of anecdotes actually cummins a few years ago decided that uh, the cummins board and you know cummins is a very traditional in that sense mechanical engineering manufacturing company right um they said that we want 50 how do we increase the number of women engineers and they were told by hr and everyone that just aren't enough women they said no go figure it out we want 50% of the entering class the graduate engineer training class to be female and of course there was uproar no it can't be done definitely cannot be done and they said no just go figure it out and guess what they did figure it out right so cummins reached its goal i think they had a goal of some 30% women and so they did reach that goal um similarly there are uh, examples at g where they actually used to invite the full family come to work oh so the husband the in-laws and parents if the if the women were not married but they would be invited to come and visit the factory or visit the office where the women worked and this is a few years ago now and they would come and they would see where their daughter or daughter in law was working and they would go back feeling so much prouder so i think there is a not everybody is sort of evil intention they really just cannot relate to right. the workplace for their woman who they see at home as a domestic being right. and what does the workplace mean for her correct like so you're situating her enough context. why do you need to work this logic why do you need to run your own company oh. your husband's earning enough this <laughs> yeah i mean there's no answer to that why do you need to do that it's not because you know you need pin money uh you need to do it for yourself you just need to do it and and in some ways it's beyond yourself right you kind of owe it to the world actually that's so a good measure is what have i contributed today what have i contributed to myself to my family to my community to my stakeholders and to the world and the very least i can contribute to myself is have i learned something today beyond that if you know, what are you contributing and if there is ability then you're kind of obligated to do something about it. actually that is a fantastic takeaway uh, mm-hmm. because when you study when you go to college or when you go to university you've taken that one seat away from a person who could have contributed as much if not more you've blocked that engineering seat or that management seat you've taken that away so now actually it is on you even if you've not done that even if you're not as qualified as anjali here <laughs> i mean that you're right i think we we need to see what do we owe to ourselves and what do we owe to society both and that's i never looked at it that way i must be honest so thank you so much rinku will possibly not allow me another question so i think she wants to open it to the audience rinku am i right about that yeah i think we've been getting some questions on our chat as well as on uh, facebook so i need to bow out of this now and thank mm-hmm. you anjali 
uh, we could probably take this conversation offline after this, but I hand it over to Rinku. And we must absolutely continue this conversation. Unfortunately, we will not have very good Chennai coffee, but we will make do with whatever we have. I know. <laughs> or something that begins with single. Mm, <laughs> possible. Single origin coffee, you mean. Oh, clearly. <laughs> very smart. <laughs> Shidari, always wonderful to be with you. Savior, thank you so much for this lovely, lovely conversation, Anjali. Sonali, that was fabulous. I think you can really bring out the best in people. And when it's somebody like Anjali, I think she's just so candid and so open. Yeah. It's, it's just uh, amazing to hear you, Anjali. So uh, would we, should we go with the questions? Prasanna, do you have anything? Priya, would you like to go? Yeah. I think I have a few questions. I'll probably read out and then uh, some of them have already been answered, uh, you know, while Shonali was asking those questions. But uh, I'm just trying to filter which has been already answered due to paucity of time. But let me begin with the first question from Amulia. Um, she's asking, is there um, a manner to help boards receive more women on boards, train them, board mentoring program? Is there mentoring on board? You know, uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, it almost feels like I have planted it because this is one of my passion areas. I, I promise you I have not planted it. But um, see, the Companies Act of 2013 now actually requires every company to have at least one woman director. And now it is one independent woman director. So beyond the compliance requirement, there is a... You know, in some ways, if you have to get somebody on your board, man or woman, you should try and get the best out of them. So I always urge boards, don't think about, oh, I need one woman director, so here is check the box. Think about how do I get the best possible person who happens to be female. So when we started the Women on Corporate Boards program, the constant refrain I would hear is, oh, but there aren't enough women. And the reason we started that program is to demonstrate that there are enough women, but because it is such a closed circuit, it's like a bit of a walled garden. Uh, the whole board space is a walled garden. You just don't know those women. Those women are there. And when we started the Women on Corporate Boards program, uh, we picked sort of our first batch of about 25 very accomplished women, CEOs, CFOs, academics, uh, women coming out of government. Um, and we actually reached out to the BSC 100 chairman and senior independent directors. So some very illustrious people saying, if we were to put together a mentorship program, because why would you want to suggest that women need any more training than men, right? So if you have a training program, it should be um, gender equivalent. The mentoring program, would you support it? I was, um, I mean, I still remember I was sitting in uh, in Masai Mara or I think Gorongoro and and beautiful place and I get this message, the first set of messages back from people after we had emailed them saying, yes, absolutely support it, Great, brilliant idea. So I think there was so much support for this, for mentoring. And uh, we had some amazing people become mentors to women who then helped them get onto board. So today from that program, we have about 125 women that sit on 300 plus boards across India. Many of them are chairing committees and sort of well on their way to continue to ascend on the board ladder. So the short point here is there are programs, there are connectivity. In fact, there's a lot more now. So most of the big four run programs for women directors and they're constantly looking for women directors. So if somebody is interested in being on a board, you must find somebody either at Thai, at um, any of the big four firms, the consulting firms, and uh, certainly FIKI and CII. I mean, I'm on the National uh, Committee for Governance at CII as well, and gender and diversity and inclusion is always an agenda. And then of course, the Women on Corporate Boards program, we handed it over to FIKI, and FIKI continued to lead it very well for many years. So I don't know if that answers the question. I think it does. Uh, and I think FIKI also did uh, some of these programs for Flow Women Directors uh, a few years ago. And uh, it was in collaboration with one of those big five. So we were able to do some of the trainings. But I think the next question, which is also interesting here, is uh, in today's scenario, many companies have weak balance sheets. When should, right. you, uh, when should you reconsider your position on a board? I mean, it's a very tricky question, but yeah, it's something. Okay, so do not reconsider your position because it is a weak balance sheet. So if you've been on a board for the last few years and today the balance sheet is weak, it means you had a role to play in the weakening of the balance sheet. So it, it is not the right reason to leave a board. 
certainly if you think that there is mis governance leading to a weak balance sheet then there is good reason to kind of raise the right questions at the board level if you are not being heard if changes are not being made if you're if you're not getting comfort with your audit report that is a good reason to raise your hand and say i'm not comfortable and i need to get off but a weak balance sheet by itself it, it is very much the responsibility of the board to guide management in strengthening it and fixing it yeah right um i have a whole list of them but i'm just going to run it a little more faster but <laughs> yeah yeah in family run boards how does one consider moving out when your inputs don't see results in family owned boards as an independent director or as a if you're a family <laughs> director you don't have an option Right. then you have to do that negotiation influencing and say you know i'd rather spend my time doing something else and you please get somebody else on the board so that's what you do if it's if you're a family director on a family board as an independent director it goes back to the same thing right it's if nobody takes on a board just for the sake of doing a board right? you are there to add value you are there to contribute to learn and if you feel that you're not able to contribute in the right way then first step is to have those discussions and they're never easy is a, a lot of the board culture tends the tone gets to get driven from the top so reach out to your chairman or somebody must have invited you to join the board so reach out to them talk to them and say i'd like to be heard more if they are good then they'll say okay what do you want to actually do mm. build a program see if you can make it work give it a couple of cycles if you're still not being heard then yes there is reason to kind of raise your hand again and say okay this is not for me um if you see malfeasance non transparency mm. um decisions that you think are going to adversely impact the business particularly around succession then those are very good reasons to kind of make your voice heard and if they are not being heard then take the step but leaving a board is not the first step i'm sure it is and um yeah so anjali in uh, today's scenario uh, you know social organizations and boards um, you know there are many social organizations how is it different from a corporate board because those are also sort of uh, having a structure in place and you know so do you think uh, it's good to be is a part of the social organization as well for women who want to contribute something in that area why not absolutely it can be part of your portfolio if you have decided to go plural and sit on boards as something you do then uh, you can create a nice portfolio of corporate boards uh, not for profit boards and sometimes even do policy work yeah. so it really depends on which area you want to contribute in i always i actually really enjoy my not for profit boards oh. because then you're not thinking about necessarily you know weak balance sheets and so on you're thinking about what's the impact i chair a couple of csr committees and i thoroughly enjoy them and i think they're, they're so rewarding so very rewarding yeah absolutely and i think it gives a sense of satisfaction as well for you know when you balance both these things uh, i have a personal question like in the sense that like, it's not from fb or something but i wanted to ask you uh, most of the times in uh, many of these uh, you know meetings that we are sitting in the in in a corporate world it sort of gets very difficult when you're sort of one single woman sitting there and it's very intimidating so have you had any situation like that and if so how did you sort of overcome that because i think a lot of them feel singled out in such places but i thought i should take your view point on right. that yeah i don't have a very good answer to that um if if you are feeling like that if you are feeling that i am the only woman in the room then uh, remember why you are in the room if you have been invited into the room because you're a woman then yeah there's something else but typically you are invited into that room because what you contribute is valuable so if you're feeling i'm the only woman in the room forget about that just focus on what you can contribute and why you are there it's not easy but you can sort of almost drill yourself to do it thank you thank you very much <laughs> it is good so do we have any more questions on fb because i am not able to see that i think we're okay i've actually had, had a couple of people i've heard a couple of things from on how can women be more effective see women tend to have high pitched voices and when they get angry or they're excited it tends to get shriller <laughs> a, a neat technique is actually wait for a lull and then speak in a lower voice and then people will pause to listen 
very very good tip i think <laughs> so so i i've shared this with a few of my younger colleagues and i'm waiting to hear from them whether this is effective but i think it works anjali one question from my side we have a lot of students over here mm -hmm. these are girls who you know want to launch their careers i'm sure they have really dreams in their eyes and they want to conquer the world and i'm sure the session with you and shanali has given them a lot of courage and inspiration what would your message to them be you know follow your dream define your dream follow your dream do the best you can you cannot compete with other people you should only compete with yourself be the best you can be play to your own potential and continuously surround yourself with positive people people who say yes you can versus no you cannot and at the end of it you know you first have to be authentic to yourself if you're not happy yourself then how will you be a happy member of society or a good mother wife whatever it is right so you first have to be happy yourself great fabulous i now and i hope there are many budding entrepreneurs here i know priya ali is on entrepreneurship yeah. so if you in, in in the entrepreneurial world we are seeing this sort of whole uh, discourse unfold and it's it's deja vu because this is the discourse we have had in the corporate world for the last sort of 20 years and it's starting to now take place in the venture funding and the entrepreneurial world is our women getting you know funding do they have enough access so you find a lot of sort of gender funds and how do you move capital to support women so in fact we do have a very active uh, national ment uh, we have a mentorship cell mm -hmm. which is for entrepreneurs and you know the smaller homepreneurs as well mm -hmm. and we do have uh, an incubation cell as well which actually helps so we've got uh, tie ups with about five uh, with five incubator startups in our city and we're actually in the process of facilitating that for our members no that's great Absolutely. Vicky, of course, has led the way with multiple women presidents, right? With Nena and now Sangeeta, actually. So it's it's terrific. Yeah. And I think today it's also more than you know, just doing projects or just uh, you know uh, having sessions. It's also about becoming a relevant voice for women, you know, yeah. so that that you can get. Create a platform for them to learn and live, as well as do business together. Entrepreneurs and affiliates, where they can get more uh, reach to us. So, if you expand the gender lens, then the expanded—not mm -hmm. the narrow aperture gender, but the wide-angle gender lens—is um, women in boardroom, women in C-suite. women in corporate but it is also supporting women led supply chains so women led businesses in your supply chain so if you are part of a large corporate or you are part of a large enterprise which i know a lot of tiki people are then are you um, encouraging more participation of women led msmes and there are a lot of women led msmes by the way the covid outcome that we uh, have seen there are the impact on job losses on women is disproportionately high it is twice the impact on jobs for men so i think this is a particularly important time for both industry and society to come together collaboratively and create sort of support programs for msmes for micro entrepreneurs and uh, it could be in the form of sort of livelihood loans so for example we are working on a livelihood loan program to support the covid impacted gig economy workers as well as msmes and a lot of these are whether it's micro entrepreneurs self employed um mm -hmm. or sgs that disproportionately impact for uh, women have been disproportionately negatively impacted true so true absolutely so good great i had a question i think it yeah. some women may want to hear this uh, what do women entrepreneurs need to do to get funding because you're in this space right so right women entrepreneurs have to do first what all the all the entrepreneurs have to do have a great business plan have a great idea start executing well then they have to network like crazy which by the way all the men do but women don't do enough of and it's not easy for women because they don't have the same um, college networks or you know yeah you know the iit networks if you will 
Uh, so they have to find access. They have to find again champions and mentors, much like we did with women in boards. You need somebody to open that door for you. They have to find mentors to do that, um, and then work really, really hard, which all entrepreneurs have to do. Correct. So the the lack of a natural network sometimes is what uh, holds women entrepreneurs back. If you look at startup teams, many of them have been at college together. They were hostel mates, or you know, they were up and down and took two, three classes in engineering school. And just the larger numbers of men lead to more natural network creation. Uh, so women, we must find ways to create more network for women. True. And whether it is through flow or tie, and I think those are natural ways to do it. I had one last question. Probably it's again a very uh, generic question for many of them. In the last few months of uh, when we started the pandemic uh, lockdown and situation, there have been a lot of uh, small uh, entrepreneurs which are you know coming up and then a lot of ideas. And also, um, I heard from a lot of them that today women uh, have increased um, to be part of a lot of corporates because they're able to work from home. The culture is sort of accepted now. So uh, do you think that, that there is more scope for women now to get into companies because this uh, good or bad, it's been a good journey for women who want to work from home. And we spoke about it a bit earlier about why women leave at 30, but this could be an extended uh, period that you know we could consider uh, some of these uh, work from home kind of. Maybe you're so I will speak it. briefly and then I will ask Shanali to comment because she raised this as well. Uh, you know, when this happened, when the pandemic and the lockdown happened, in for the first few weeks, we were like, yay, this is going to solve the whole work from home taboo problem. Everyone's working from home. So it should actually facilitate the participation of more women in the workforce. What we have found, however, is that the, uh, the domestic burden is disproportionately shouldered by women. So if the current model continues with everybody from home or um, the spouse and extended family and children and so on from home, it might actually make it harder for women to work because they are not able to find their space and acquired space to work and a rhythm in which they can work from home. On the other hand, once we go back outside, sort of we unlock fully, I think the the work, how you work model, uh, workplace will change. And I don't think we are ever going back, at least I hope not in the near term, going back to everybody in the office because really you don't need it. And it is so much more efficient to save commute time, for example. At that time, I think particularly given technology and the rapid pace of digitalization. So one of the big trends we have seen is massive digitalization. The slope of the curve has become even steeper, more positive. It should facilitate companies to first do more gig work with women. So flexing work, mm. three hours, four hours. You know, I have a company uh, called Coverfox where when the lockdown happened, we, we were running a start to support uh, for assisted sales. And in two days flat, our tech team actually rolled out a remote call center. The positive unintended consequence was the recognition that you no longer need people to come to the office one. Two, you can actually find women in tier two, tier three, two service agents and kind of service sales agents for you. And so we are actually going to increase the number of women that work at CoverFox consequently. So technology enabled. But Shanali, over to you. Well, no, I just think that everything really just boils down to conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, women being taught not to speak out of turn, not to speak up. I think that even to get that sort of uh, support from your family or your husband during the lockdown time because he's working and mm-hmm. you're working, you need to have a conversation about it. And mm-hmm. I think somewhere not be free, not be afraid to, I think above all, you have to be true to yourself. Mm-hmm. So in, I think in every sphere of life, my big learning has been that do it gently, but speak your truth. You don't have to go hammer and tongs and be aggressive. Mm-hmm. That really isn't always the definition of feminism, which is why some women are even afraid to call themselves a feminist. I remember mm-hmm. Priyanka Chopra said somewhere, I'm not a feminist, and the whole world in patriarchy came at her and trolled her for that. <laughs> the thing is that just <laughs> yourself, yourself, ask for your me time, don't be afraid. Right. Um, you just demand it, and you'll have to do it even increasingly so in this work from home environment. You will have to do it increasingly so unless uh, you and your husband have arrived at a conclusion that he's a primary bread earner and therefore right. everything doesn't have to be man versus woman, it's logic. Mm-hmm. If he's bringing, you know, the bread and the caviar to the table and you are actually, you know, just a sideshow, then you can then manage to take care of your kids. So it's, you know, you have to work this out, but that can only happen with a civilized conversation between two, you know, 
I mean, I think my husband's afraid to say a lot of things to me because he knows. <laughs> so, you know, so actually, women can only do more at work when men do more at home. Yes. So yeah. that partnership model has to be evolved, and it may happen family by family or systemically. There are, you know, northern European countries that have managed to find that balance where there is a partnership model. Yeah. But truly, women can only do more at work if men do more at home. Yeah, there's got to be fairness at play. I feel, you know, hmm. uh, and also as a woman, if your if your if your work isn't demanding so many hours, but you still want equal number of hours of freedom, then it's somewhere you're being unfair to the situation. So, yeah, and you know, Shunali, what is freedom? If if you enjoy your work, work is not work. That's right. Thank you. It's uh, the more you do, the more you want because That's it's fun. True. That's true. you enjoy it. True. So I think we've come to the end of our time. Yes, and I know you have a five thirty, as you told me. So, but thank you so much for accommodating the change today, both of you. It really, really meant a lot. Jayashree, over to you. Thank you, Anjali, for your entrepreneurial wisdom. The message was much needed right now, as many small and medium business owners are wondering how to survive this onslaught. So, right. beginning from your uh, experiences in mckinsey being the only woman in many of the meetings uh, everything you said was so interesting and inspiring and uh, when it comes to women it's not about equality but it's about inclusion that was well said so many takeaways from this uh, meeting i can go on uh, build your domestic infrastructure no winners and losers at home all need to be winners at home so many So thank you so much, Anjali. Thank you, Shunali, for moderating this webinar and making the conversation lively by narrating your experiences too. Your questions were based on research and numbers and were just spot on, so that made the conversation all the more insightful. So last but not the least, I thank our past chairpersons, past presidents, and members of the GB, and members themselves of uh, members of Flow for being a part of this session. We have lined up. some interesting meetings through the month and uh, the next webinar is on 13th where we have mr arzan kambata who is an artist sculptor filmmaker and actor he'll be sharing a lot of interesting stories about his diverse interests and doodle art in particular so please do mark your calendars and do support us with your presence thank you once again anjali and thank you shunal it was a wonderful meeting thank you stay safe stay well Thanks Anjali for your Friday event. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you girls. Bye. Bye.